Jesus can resolve in time you get involved with our God he cares about us so wait on the Lord wait on the Lord wait on the Lord and you Praise the Lord, church. Let us start gathering together, stand up and worship in the Lord this morning. Let this day not be just any other Sunday morning. Let it be a change in your life, some healing, some restoration. Oh, let's start worshiping the Lord God that is here in this place, the way maker, the miracle worker. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Yes, Lord, we're here to change our lives. We're here to get a refreshment. We're here to get an anointing. We're here to get a change and a healing, Lord. Oh, we are here this day and this morning, Lord Jesus, to worship you. Oh, to just give you the worship to your worthy of Lord Jesus. Oh, yes, Lord, you can cry out to the Lord. Oh, it doesn't matter what you came with this morning. He is here in this place. He is here waiting for you to tell them what you are in need of. He is waiting for you to cry out to him. Oh, he is the God that loves us. He is the God that's ready to give us what we need in Jesus' name. Let's worship and cry out to him this morning, Lord. Oh, yes, Lord Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, yeah, Lord. to lift up the name of Jesus. Is anybody glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Put your hands together.
ahead and just lift up your voice to the Lord. We know that you're able, Jesus. Oh, we trust you, Lord. So we will praise you in advance like the victories in hand, knowing you. By our faith, we believe it's done. We receive it. We receive it. You say, so we will praise you in advance. Like the victory's already won. Knowing you are not a man. You pay our lives. If you said victory will come. Treasure of my heart and of my soul. 
Worship him right now. Let's continue to worship him. Let's continue to praise him. Hallelujah. We're going to put our flesh aside. We're going to put every distraction away. And we're going to just focus on giving God glory and giving him praise. Because he's been too good. He's been amazing. God, we worship you this morning. We give you the praise, God. We exalt your name. We worship you. We magnify you, Lord. We crown you with our worship. We crown you with our praise this morning. We give you glory, we give you glory. Come on, let's give him another hand praise this morning. If you're thankful to be in the house of the Lord, make it a little bit louder. If you're grateful to be in his presence, come on, give him a shout of praise. We could be anywhere else, but we're in his presence this morning. Thank you, Jesus, for saving us, Lord. Thank you for rescuing us, God. Hallelujah. Oh, we glorify you, Lord. We give you praise, we give you praise. Come on, and let's continue to worship as you make your way back to your seats, amen. Anybody grateful to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen, let's just all take a deep breath and thank the Lord for the breath in our lungs, amen. Praise God, he's given us life and we're able to be in his presence today, amen. And so we're just thankful to be in, this, in the house of the Lord this morning. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna continue to worship the Lord, but we're gonna worship in the giving of our tithing and our offering this morning. So this morning, if you're gonna be giving by way of cash or check and you need a contribution envelope, would you please just raise your hand? They got these fine young gentlemen right here that are walking down the aisles and all you have to do is lift your hand up and they'll give you a contribution envelope. And you, those are the different ways you can give this morning. If not, there are several ways that you can give. If you're not giving by cash or check, there are several ways that you can give by looking on the screen behind me and to the left and to the right of me. Amen. And so while you get your offering ready, we're going to go ahead and go over some verbal announcements this morning. We don't have any video announcements today, but we are excited because Vacation Bible School is this week. Come on, can we make some noise for Vacation Bible School? Amen. That is Vacation Bible School, June the 27th through the 30th. That is a Tuesday through Friday. Our entire church campus, not just the sanctuary, the whole campus is going to be transformed into a children's vacation Bible school. It's an amazing theme this year as well, like every year it has been. Start telling your friends and your family and even your neighbors. VBS is one of POK's biggest outreach efforts, and it's such a blessing to all the kids that attend. This is for ages 4 through 11. So if you have a child, a neighbor, or anybody who wants to come that's age 4 through 11, make sure they come. There is a link that you can register that is found online. You have to sign up. A reminder that that week, this week coming up, there is no Wednesday service the week of VBS. And I thought I saw a post that there is a deadline. Monday at noon? Is that still? Okay, Monday at noon... Uh, that is the deadline for you to register your child, 4 through 11 for VBS, so make sure you do that today. And also we have July 5th, that is a Wednesday, the day after July 4th. Um, we have a special service planned in honor of Independence Day. And there's only going to be one service on June 5th at 7.30. There is going to be no 6 o'clock service, so uh, just so you know that. Uh, that is July the 5th. That is Wednesday. Also, end time Bible prophecy class. Have you ever wondered how past and current events relate to the prophecies in the Bible? Find those answers to this and more in the upcoming end time Bible prophecy class. Classes are Tuesday at 7 p.m. That's Tuesday at 7 p.m. here at the church in the preteen sanctuary beginning on July the 11th. Okay. Uh, to sign up. Visit the Connect booth in the foyer or use the link in the POK member Facebook page. Okay, so those are the announcements for this morning. Why don't we go ahead and stand to our feet 
and let's hold our offering. Let's pray over it in Jesus' name. God, we thank you, Lord, for the gift and the giver this morning. Thank you for providing everything that we need, Lord. And we give back to what you've given to us, God, for your kingdom. Let it be for the advancement of it, God. We give you glory. We give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. Why don't you come forward and deposit your offering this morning. God bless you. Everybody say no.
Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Has God been good to anybody in the house? Has he delivered you? Has he saved you? Put food on the table, clothes on your back. Anybody driving a nice car today? God is good. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated. What a wonderful presence of the Lord in the house this morning. Anybody feel the Lord today? Praise the Lord. He's here. Amen. I do want to make a quick plug. Texas Bible College fall semester is coming up very shortly. We'll give you more information about that very soon. Got a praise report this morning. Do you enjoy praise reports? Hallelujah. I got a call this week from my, my Aunt Elaine, or Aunt Elaine, if you're from the north. And my Aunt Elaine said to me that God had healed her. I said, well, what happened? She said, I had, and I didn't even know this. I don't know how I missed the memo, but she had cancer in her head. And she had a piece of it, or, you know, they thought they got it all originally removed surgically from her head. But come to find out they had missed some of it, or they couldn't get all of it. And they called her back, and they said, well, we missed some of it. We couldn't get it all, and we're going to have to get the rest of it another way, and that is through radiation therapy. Well, an apostolic preacher came by and prayed for her, and then she went back for preparation for her radiation, and they did some more tests and come to find out it had vanished away. She could not find any, they could not find any of the cancer. They reported to her, you are now cancer free. No radiation treatment necessary. We serve a miracle working God. His name is Jesus. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. If you need a miracle, this could be your day. My God is able. Praise the name of the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, we want to thank you for being with us here today at the Pentecostals. Of course, we have a lot of people that are watching online around the world, listening via Revival Radio, YouTube, Facebook. Can we give all of our online guests a hand of appreciation? Thank you for tuning in today. Now, if this is your first or your second time here at the Pentecostals, first or second time, and you have not yet filled out one of our guest cards or you have not checked in with one of the hosts on our iPad, would you raise your hand at this time? First or second time, have not filled out a guest card. Our ushers are making their way through the sanctuary. They'd love to give you one. This is not so we will give you a bunch of spam mail. This is because we want to be a blessing unto you. In just a moment, we're gonna give a little yellow token or blue token to our guests, and uh, you can redeem those tokens after church in our cafe for free stuff. How many like free stuff? As pastor said, even if you don't like the preaching or the singing, you might as well get the free stuff. Praise the name of the Lord. Okay, so I have a few names here I'm going to read out. If I call your name or something that sounds like your name, if you just raise your hand or wave your hand so we know where our guests are seated this morning, we just want to welcome you for being here today. All right, we have some first-time guests, uh, Dana, Mull, and Kristen, and Felicity, and Joseph. I hope I'm saying those names right. Where are you guys this morning? I miss, ah, oh, there you are. God bless you. Thank y'all for being here. Jamel George, where are you, Jamel? Jamel George. Hey, Jamel, God bless you. Hey, Amen, right up here in the front. Then we have a Stan Tiller. Stan, where are you this morning? There you are in the back. God bless you, Stan. Appreciate you being with us here this morning. Luis and Evelyn Gomes. Where are you folks? All the way in the back. All right. Thank you for being with us. Hey, Amen. We do have one second time guest, Michael Longino. I hope I'm saying that right. Michael, thank you, Michael, for being with us. God bless you. We have a couple of special guests, and truly all of our guests are special, but special guests or friends or family of members that are here. We have a couple of those here this morning. Mike Welsh, where are you this morning? Mike in the back, God bless you. This is friends, I guess, of Sister Pamela and Saul. Ah, okay. God bless you, your dad. Uh, Thomas Maggio, did I say it right? Thomas, God bless you. Glad you're here this morning. 
Amen. Why don't we stand? We're going to put five minutes on the clock. We're going to ask you to just step out of your seat, mingle around, shake some hands, especially that of our guests. And we'll be back in five minutes. Youth and preteen can be dismissed at this time. God bless you.
is still washing away sins. It is still rewriting history. Hallelujah. You can look in my past, but all you're going to see is the blood that he shed on Calvary. Hallelujah. There's nowhere it can't reach. You can't get over it or around it. God bless you. Turn to someone near you, smile at them, shake their hand, and say, thank God for the blood. And you can be seated for just a moment. One quick announcement, or an, an addition to an announcement we made earlier regarding Vacation Bible School. Now, this is starting Tuesday evening, and while the online registration does close at noon, kids can register at the door even the day of on Tuesday. I want to emphasize to you, there's no cost for this. VBS is 100% free for the kids that come and register. Um, we do accept um, donations. Uh, we have we're expecting at least 200 children and about 100 volunteers, so we have to feed those folks every night. And now there are T-shirts that are available for sale. That's not a required. Kids who register don't have to buy a T-shirt, but the T-shirt sales also help offset some of the costs. So VBS is one of the most exciting outreaches we have here at the Pentecostals. It's going to be an exciting week. If your kids aren't signed up, you need to make sure they get signed up for it today. Amen. Let's clap our hands to the Lord. Oh, somebody thank God for the blood one more time. Hallelujah. Amen. So, BBS, you don't want to miss it. Let's stand together as Pastor McKee comes. Let's welcome our pastor this morning. Amen. guests that are with us today. My name is Rob McKee, and that sweet, beautiful lady that was leading us singing a moment ago is my wife, Shara, and it's just great being in the house of God uh, this morning, and uh, I love good news, and I like to share good news, and uh, it's, it's just, it's a great, great day for the kingdom of the Lord, and I'm, I'm very excited about VBS this week, and I just want to encourage you, be a part of it. Uh, God is, is, uh, has blessed the church with the ability to minister our, to our kids. Someone once recently asked me the, the purpose of special promotions in the church, and believe it or not, there are people that feel like, well, the church doesn't need all of that, and it's true. First century church didn't have, at least we don't have a record of them having um, a lot of the I guess, uh, auxiliary ministries that we have today. Um, but I, I really, I just as a father, uh, I, I want my kids to be excited about church. And so I think it's, I think it's important. And um, I think it's, it's, it's a very big deal that we do everything we can to teach our children about the Lord. But let's make it fun for our kids. I want my kids to feel like they are valued and, and uh, children's ministry has always been an important part of our church and our values of our church. Before I became a preacher uh, of, to adults, I was a children's evangelist. 
I know some of you may find that hard to believe, but I, uh, the w way that I know the King's Clown, Brother Lloyd Squires, is that he and I have done kids' camps all across the U.S. together, and uh, we have had a, we, um, I used to do that. That was my thing. So there'd be someone else that would go preach to the adults, and I'd be stuck over next door with all the kids. And, uh, but I, I thank God there was a whole lot of kids that received the Holy Ghost during those seasons of life. And, amen. So I honor all those that feel that calling. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Psalms, chapter 57. And we'll, we're going to read somewhat of a lengthy, 11 verses. I shouldn't call it lengthy. Uh, we'll lead, read a very short portion of Scripture. Uh, 11 verses of it. And then we're going to turn over to 1 Samuel chapter 22. <clears throat> and um, But it is good to be in God's house. I wonder if once you find your Scripture, if you could take your Bible. And I want you to hold it up to your heart. And I want us to, uh, to make this song a song of prayer to the Lord, a petition to the Lord. And um, amen. If we could, just take your Bible. If you're reading your Bible on your phone or your iPad, just kind of hold that up to your heart. And I believe that God wants us to approach his word with honor and with respect. So it's our time to kind of focus our attention on the word. word Join in with us God, and sing this song. Speak to me. Speak to me. I'm ready, I'm ready to receive the Word of God. Speak to me. I'm ready to receive. Search me. Search me. Try me. I'm ready to receive. Word of God, speak to me. You are a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The way, the truth, my life. Word of God, speak to me. from Psalms. Let me get a handheld. I think that's going to be better this morning. Amen. All right. That's, is that better? Can y'all hear me? All right. You probably could hear me fine before, but we had a really bad ringing up here in this monitor. So, um, I don't want to hurt anybody's ears. Uh, Psalms 57 and verse number one says, be merciful unto me. O God, be merciful unto me. For my soul trusteth in thee, yea, in the shadow of thy wings, I will make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. Everybody read it out loud with me. I will cry unto God most high, unto God that performeth all things for me. He shall send from heaven and save me from the reproach of him that swallow me up, Selah. God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. My soul is among lions, and I lie even among them that are set on fire. And the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows, and their tongue is a sharp sword. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens, and let thy glory be above all the earth. They have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They have digged a pit before me into the midst whereof they are fallen themselves, Selah. My heart is fixed, O God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Awake up my glory, awake psaltery and harp. I will myself will awake early. I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing unto thee among the nations. 
for thy mercy is great unto the heavens and thy truth unto all unto the clouds be thou exalted O God above the heavens and let thy glory be above all the earth now thank you for following along in the somewhat lengthy verses I, I don't like to do that because I know it's hard to retain everything that you read when you have so many verses but I think it's important that that we read through the scripture I'm, we're going to be looking back at this Psalms 57 but now I want us to read the context of Psalms 57 where and when in the life of David this psalm was written first Samuel 22 just three verses of scripture and then I'm going to, we're going to pray and be seated but first Samuel 22 says David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave Adullam and when his brethren and all his father's house heard it they went down thither to him and everyone that was in distress and everyone that was in debt and everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him and he became a captain over them and there were with him about 400 men verse number five final verse and the prophet Gad said unto David abide not in the hold depart and get thee into the land of Judah then David departed and came into the forest of Harath. Amen. We're going to uh, title this message today, continuing our series, first of all, through uh, the Psalms. We're calling it Psalms in the Summer, Psalms for the Summer. But um, we're going to call this one today, A Song for a Cave. A Song for a Cave. Amen. Lay your Bibles down and let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you for every person that's gathered in this place. Father, I pray that you would be with us in a special way today help us Lord Jesus to hear your voice in all that we do I ask God that you would be with us help me God to preach your word with anointing help me Lord Jesus God touch my mind God to deliver it as you gave it to me in Jesus name we pray and everyone said amen turn around at least three people give them a high five in Jesus name Amen. you may be seated In the middle of the crystal blue uh, Algean Sea, uh, on the small and rocky island of Patmos, Greece, there is a cave there. And this cave is called the Cave of the Apocalypse. If, I believe I have a picture of it. If you could put the picture of the cave, that's actual recent picture of the Cave of the Apocalypse. And just leave that picture up for a moment if you could. Many, there are many uh, recognized biblical sites today in, all across the Middle East and what we call the Holy Land. Uh, but many of those sites are nothing more than guesses. My wife and I had this brief conversation this morning. That's probably one of the things that bugs me the most about Israel and Jerusalem is that they, everybody's looking to make money on Christians and they just want to point, oh yeah, that's that's... That's where Pentecost happened, uh, or that's, you know, that's right there is uh, where Jesus was crucified. And the truth is, most are simply guesses. We don't really know uh, the markers. There are a few places that we are very certain, things that we are assuredly are actual locations mentioned in Scripture because of, um, of remnants of archaeology that remain. And in particular, though, this cave on Patmos is one of the places that is almost 100% verified. It is the place where the Apostle John wrote the book of Revelation. And he spent roughly about two years there when uh, the Roman Emperor uh, Domitian in, um, in 95 AD exiled him there. And he stayed, stayed there two years in that place. And from this room, this actual cave, is where John wrote the book of Revelation uh, and received all the visions of the end time eschatology and all the coming events that will come to the earth. And then he also, uh, from this location, wrote the Gospel of John. Now, uh, the reason why I bring this up is not so much just to show you a biblical site, but um, it's, it's fascinating to me that they they wrote or they actually uh, built a, a church around it around uh, I think it was 1030 or 1030 
1, 10, 32, um, they built a monastery, a Greek Orthodox monast uh, monastery. Uh, I believe I've got a picture of that. Um, they call it the, the Church of St. John the Theologian. That's it right there. Just leave it on that picture. And that is the actual monastery. When you go into this church, the last thing you're expecting to find inside of a church is a cave. Uh, further leaders, world leaders, and, and, uh, uh, and uh, some emperors went even further. And they actually turned this church, on the outskirts of this church, they have built walls around it and turned it into a fortress. And I think I've got a picture of that. Uh, as well. It is. It has become a fortress. So if you get through the fortress, you're not expecting a church to be in that, are you? Uh, but that, that doesn't look like a church. Uh, but if you get in past the walls, you find a church, the last thing you're expecting in the middle of a church is a cave. Uh, but that's the whole purpose, it seems, of them building the church in that location. <clears throat> and I, I think it's it's a good practical illustration that just because you're in the church, it does not exempt you from having times of trouble. Uh, you're in the church, but you can still be in a cave of isolation, a cave of discouragement, a cave of depression. Thank God we're in the church. But just because you're in the church, all your problems did not evaporate. There are still times that you can go through troubles and we tend to retreat to these places where we wall off the world. And if we're not careful, we'll do exactly what Greece did and we'll fortify our cave and we'll put walls around our cave. And you just thought you had trouble getting in before. We're going we're gonna to keep everybody out. You know, there are, there are times when our songs of life become songs of lament. And I, I, I don't necessarily think there's anything wrong with that. I don't believe God is offended by our, um, uh, by our songs of reality. When we're telling God, this is where I'm at. This is what I'm feeling. And there are times that we, we will sing the blues. Anybody ever sing the blues? Amen. Last week, we preached about how important it is to keep singing until our songs of blues turn to songs of praise. And I want to pick up where we left off. And I want to look again at this patriarch, this songwriting patriarch, David. We know for certain that he wrote 72 of the 150 psalms in the book of songs, the book of the songbook, the Hebrew songbook. And it was, of course, assembled by David. And the, the words of the Psalms, if you're new to the uh, this series and you haven't heard us preach about it, I just want to tell you that just reading through the Psalms, I don't think it has to be complicated for you to get anything out of it. I think we have all had moments in life where reading through Scripture and we read through the Psalms and just the words themselves are liberating and powerful. Um, I, I don't know how many preachers I've heard step up to the podium in the middle of a service and they just start quoting one of the Psalms. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he who hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Why? I'm glad you asked. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. Amen. I'm thankful for the Psalms. There's power in those words. And I, I don't have to know anything about else about the Psalms except the words themselves to be blessed. Anybody with me? You, you ever just read through? And it wasn't a deep dive into the context, into the meaning of every word. You just read on the surface of the words, and it changed your perspective, and it changed your paradigm of life. And, and, and I think that's powerful about the Psalms. The Psalms are, are, are powerful. But when we take that next step, and we go further past the words of the song, and we connect with the psalmist himself, and we see the context of the psalm, uh, I tell you, it just, it adds a depth to the worship. Have you ever, uh, you know, one of the things that fascinates me when I hear stories of songs that I'm, we're all familiar with uh, uh, is, is to hear the story behind the song. 
what, 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 what was going through your life and your, through your mind when you wrote this particular song that we all sing and we're all familiar with? I think, uh, for me personally, I, I think it, it adds depth to the song. I mean, and I'm not talking about secular music, and we've all heard those songs, but, but it sort of makes all the lyrics take on a deeper and more significant light. Anybody know what I'm talking about? When you hear the story behind why the song was written and where the author was when they wrote the song. So Psalms 57 is one of those psalms that we have a sort of a, a marker. We have sort of a geo marker. We know exactly when and where this particular psalm uh, was written and what was going on in the life of David when he was writing this, this particular Psalms 57. He actually wrote two Psalms, but we're only going to deal with Psalms 57. And Psalms 57, David is sitting in the cave of Adullam. And at this point, his, he is discouraged. He's fighting depression. And in particular, David is wrestling with isolation. He feels like the world is against him. And he retreats to this cave. All of those people that were singing his praises when he came back from the battle of Gath and, and defeating Goliath, all those multitudes that were shouting, David has killed his ten thousands, those people have evaporated. All the fan club is gone now, and people are trying to kill him. And I'm certain that David was probably wondering, where'd y'all go? <laughs> Who's going to protect me? Who's going to fight for me? Who's going to, I mean, there's people trying to kill me. You think I've killed 10,000. You're singing my song, my, my praises yesterday, but today you're silent. Anybody ever felt that way? All the people that love me, they have somehow disappeared. I've been through moments when, when the enemy comes after you, and at those moments when it feels like there's an onslaught of hell or, or there's opposition that comes against you, even through people, you know, it, it seems as though in those moments that all the people that once praised you are nowhere to be found. I'm sure Jesus experienced that feeling in the Garden of Gethsemane whenever Judas kissed him on the cheek and, and even the people that were saying, I'm, I'm going to be with you to death. I mean, old Simon Peter, don't worry about it. I'm going to fight for you. All of those people, they left. They failed. You know, all Simon Peter was talking about the last few months of, 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 uh, that were leading up to Calvary was, Jesus, I got your back. I got your back, Jesus. I got your back. And then... And then the soldiers arrest him, and where's Peter? You got my back, Peter? I don't see. Maybe you get a little closer to my back. But, but that's where David is at this point. He's discouraged. People have forsaken him. It's interesting to get a picture of where David is uh, because at this moment, other people hear that David's in the cave. I'm sure he wanted some to hear that he was there, and the crowds begin to assemble. But it wasn't the encouragers that, that he attracts. The people that find David in the cave uh, were the people who were distressed, everybody that was in debt, everybody that was discontent. They all come to David, but they're not coming to help him or encourage him. They're looking for leadership. They're looking for him to solve their problems. Have you ever been in a place in life where you needed encouragement? You needed somebody to lift you up, a place, you know, just where I just need one or two people to call me on the phone and, and just pick me up. I'm at a low point. Unfortunately, it's at that, those moments that people do come. And what they, what they do when they come is not what you expect. You thought they were coming to lift you up. The phone rings. and Maybe you get a text that says, hey, can I talk to you right now? And you're thinking, just what I need. I need a word from the Lord. And you call them, yes, yes, I'm free to talk right now. I need that word. And they say, hey, I need you to pray for me right now because I need a word from you. That's not what I was expecting. I was, <laughs> I was thinking you were going to lift me up, but all I'm doing is attracting other people that need lifting up. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And, and, you know, that, that's, that's what isolation will do for you. It creates, first of all, a desire for comfort from other people. You want somebody to pull you out of your cave. I just, I just need somebody, anybody, 
to know, to recognize the fact that I am drowning in depression, that I'm about to lose everything here and I need somebody to reach out to me in this moment and, and let me know that I'm not as alone as I really feel. Amen. Because in these moments, people are doing nothing encouraging, but they're expecting something out of me that I feel incapable of giving right now. I'm an empty vessel. I am depleted. I don't have anything left to give. I'm, I'm isolating because I'm afraid of people. I, I thought people were going to rally around me. And yet everybody just wants something from me. They want me to pour more out. Any, am I preaching to anybody here this morning? That you, you get those, into those low points in life and you just feel like, God, where are the encouragers? Where are the Barnabases? I mean, I need somebody to walk up and say, hey, listen, it's going to be okay. But all they're doing is walking up and saying, hey, listen, is it going to be okay? It's no wonder that while David is in the cave, he said, all oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. He was thirsty. He wanted something to drink. And a lot of times I've read over that verse and I thought, well, man, he just was expressing a need. But if you, if you missed it, you have to go back to the beginning. And what David wanted wasn't just the water. What he wanted was somebody else to get him water. That, that's, that's what really mattered to him was, I just need somebody to show me that they care about me, that they can provide for my refreshing, that they, they care enough about me that they're going to minister to me because all I've got are people around me. They all have their hands out. They all want something from me. But here I am at this low point of discouragement, and I feel like giving up, and all I get is more, hey, I need this, and I need that. Oh, I wish somebody would just get me a drink of water. Amen, I wish somebody would help me. I wish somebody, and, and thank God, David had some mighty men, three unnamed mighty men uh, around him that fought through the garrison of the Philistines, and they brought David some water from the well of Bethlehem. But when they brought the water back, now I, I wasn't expecting this, and I'm certain the three mighty men weren't expecting it either. Um, these men risked their life to help David satisfy his whim or his desire. And they bring back this water. You got to imagine these guys as they hand David this vessel of water and say, we did it. We sacrificed. We helped you. And in that moment, David, instead of being grateful and saying, thank you, you guys are good servants. David takes that and immediately repents and pours it out on the ground. Now, if I'm one of those mighty men, I got a problem with that. <laughs> I just risked my life for you, and you're pouring out what I put my life on the line for. But you see, David wasn't just pouring it out on the ground, but he, David was pouring it out as an offering to the Lord. Amen. It, it, that's what scripture says. He poured it out before the Lord. Amen. The, the, the problem wasn't with the mighty man. The problem was David had the wrong attitude and the wrong paradigm. And it wasn't until he saw the sacrifice of others that he realized, I'm not worthy of this. That, that I've got people serving me. I've got people doing thing, things because they like me. And, and, but the truth is, I don't deserve any of it. God is the only one that is worthy of sacrifice. God is the only one that's worthy of service. Amen. You see, caves have a way of causing uh, good men, brave men, valiant men to lose their perspective. And in their own mind, in their own image, they become victims of life. But David understood at that point, it's not about me, and it's not about my desire. God, you're the only one that is worthy. And he poured it out as an act of praise. I, I think there's, there's something about isolation that does that to us. Causes us to turn inwards and expect people to meet needs in our life. 
and I, I don't know if you've ever had one of these experiences where you feel uh, betrayed or you feel alone in particular. You feel isolated and you're longing for somebody to encourage you, but, but no one does. And if you've ever been in that point, I, I know you want things to change, but, but you can feel almost as though everything is falling apart. It's the whole world. I mean, it's bad. You, you can, you know, you can lament and talk about how bad life is. I, you know, in moments like that, it reminds me of the football lineman. I, I don't know if you've ever told that story, but the football lineman that lined up on the, on the line and actually an interviewer, let me back up, a, a reporter asked them after the game, how is it that you've had so many sacks of the quarterback and, and you're just an amazing lineman, nobody can stop you. And he told him, here's what I do. He said, every time I line up on the line and I, there's, a, there's a opposing football player that's lining up. He said, and I talk to them before the play. Here's what I say. He said, um, I, I will look at them in their eyes and I'll say, in just a minute, the ball is going to be uh, snapped. They're going to hike the ball. And when that ball is hiked, you're going to try to stop me. And if, if you stop me, then there's a good chance that your team is going to move the ball down the field. And, it, and if you keep moving the ball down the field, there's a good chance that you're going to get really close to, um, you know, to the, the, the end zone to make a touchdown. And if, if you get close enough to the end zone to make a touchdown, there's a good chance that you're going to score. And if you keep scoring, there's a good chance that you're, that you guys are going to win and we're going to lose this game. And if we lose this game, there's a good chance that the coach is going to blame me for losing this game. And if we lose this game and the coach is blaming me, there's a good chance that eventually he's going to put me on the bench and I won't get to start anymore. And if I don't get to start in this football, on this football team anymore, there's going to be a, a moment when the owner's going to, he's going to be looking for people that he can trade to other teams. And he's, he's going to say, Hey, this guy's not worth it. And he's going to put me up for being traded and if they put me up for being traded there's a good chance that other teams will say hey if it didn't work there he won't hurt work here and so there's no need for us to have him play for us and he said and, and, and if nobody wants me to play for their team then there's a good chance that that I'm not going to get to play football anymore and I'll lose my source of income and if I lose my source of income then eventually my money is going to run out and if my money runs out then eventually I'm going to lose my house and if I lose my house then eventually I may not even be able to afford food for my family and if I can't afford food for my family then then there's a good chance that my children are gonna starve to death he said so I line up on that line and I say to the opposing player why are you trying to kill my wife and kids Why is it that that becomes our attitude when we get into a cave? We become so fatalistic. We think everything is falling apart. This is the end of everything. When the truth is, God has everything in his perfect will. It's not as bad as what it seems in those moments of the cave. But caves have a way of turning us into victims. The, you know, the prophet Elijah in 1 Kings 19 had a tremendous emotional victory over the prophets of Baal. But a leader, one person with a carnal, selfish, and vengeful spirit drove him into isolation. Imagine, Elijah stands up to 400 of, of Baal's prophets, or were actually a total of 800. 400 of them were prophets of Baal. And he stands up to all of them with boldness. I mean, the kind of boldness where he's mocking them. Maybe your God's asleep. I mean, he's cocky. He's, he's at that point and he's, he's making fun of everybody. What boldness and, and just audacity. You think you're, you're tougher than me. 800 people, he's, he's staring them all down. And yet one person has the ability to drive him into isolation fascinates me human nature 
We, we can be bold with everybody, but there's one or two people in our, every one of our lives that have a way of driving us into a cave of depression, discouragement, and isolation. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Just one or two people. It might be a spouse. It might be a coworker. It might be a relative. It might, it might be your children. But somebody has the power to completely discourage you, to make you feel like I want to give up. I don't want to do anything. And it could be on the heels of great victory. But that one person makes a comment. That one person makes a few statements or threats. And man, here I am living in a cave living in isolation and so that's what happened with Elijah and he runs to what what uh, first Kings 19 says was the mountain of God or literally Mount Horeb and it was there that Moses received the Ten Commandments now it's uh, not for the sermon today but it always it always uh, uh, made me curious of why when Jesus met on Mount Transfiguration, why did he meet with Moses and Elijah? Of all the people he could have met with. And the, the typical answer you'll find in most commentaries is that Moses, you know, Moses represented the law, which is true. I get that. But then they say, well, Elijah represented the prophets. But why would Elijah represent the prophets? I mean, if you're, if you're talking about, you know, the best of the best, who represented the prophets the best, I mean, you really, you'd have to give that to Elisha, who did twice as many miracles. Now, if you're talking about prophesying future events, then, then you have to give that title to Isaiah, who, I mean, one of the largest of the Old Testament books of the Bible. I mean, he wrote more about the coming Messiah than any of the other Old Testament prophets, or maybe Jeremiah, who stood and gave a negative report, but, but, but obeyed the Lord. I mean, there's a lot of other qualifiers that, that could be used, but for some reason, it was Elijah. I don't think it was because Moses represented the law or, Mo, or Elijah represented the prophets. I think it was because of this event here. That both men, at one point in their life, they had something very in common. And that was both men visited that same place looking for an answer, a word from God. Both men had, had a, an experience of fire and earthquake and, and wind. And in that moment, they both got a revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen. But, but it, it's, it's, it's fascinating to me that when, when Elijah runs to this particular cave, I, I wonder what his motivation was. Obviously, if it was Mount Horeb, there was something significant about this cave. Well, I, I think it's very likely that this cave was the cleft of the rock described um, in, in Exodus that where, where Moses was when he received this revelation. So it's in the same place, same mountain. Elijah is running there on purpose. There's something significant about that that place in that moment. And it seems as though in this moment of question and uncertainty, Elijah is running for a place of significance, a place where God has met with his people and demonstrated his glory and his power. And, and he, he wanted to go there. I'm going to go back there because that's where God's, he's thundered from the mountain and he's, you know, that, that's where God demonstrated his glory and his omnipotence and power. And then when he gets there, the wind blows, but God's not in it. The earthquake came, but God wasn't in it. The fire fell, but God wasn't in that either. But it was in a still small voice that God began to speak. And God began to talk to Elijah. Too often, I believe that when we get in these places of isolation through hurt, pain, whatever is causing it, we, we often retreat back to old experiences when God is trying to do something new in our life. And God is trying to talk to us. You might have thought that God would have honored his retreat, but God instead questions the motivation of Elijah's decision. That, that he, and he asks, Elijah, what are you doing here? Elijah had the wrong spirit. He had the wrong attitude. And just, just because I demonstrated my glory and earthquakes and fire and, and wind doesn't mean I'm going to do the same thing for you. That's not what you need right now. 
too often we're, we're asking God for a demonstration, a powerful demonstration. And what God is looking for is a conversation. 1 Kings 19 and 10, we, we read of Elijah's response. And he, here's what he says. He says, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the, the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant and thrown down thine altars and, and have slain thy prophets with a sword. And I, even I, only am left. And they seek my life to take it away. You kind of get the theme of what he's saying? This is all about me. I'm living in a me world, me universe, and I'm revolving around me. It's, it's all about me. Look at everything that I've done for you, God. Look at all of, of the boldness I've demonstrated, and now I've got people that are about to kill me. Now I'm alone. And God tells him, I, I want you to go and stand on a mountain. Of course, after the wind, the earthquake, and all of that, God speaks to him, and he covers his face in a mantle. It's a sign of humility. It's, something happened in that moment when he heard the voice of God, and Elijah recognized, I've got the wrong spirit. I've got the wrong attitude. This is not about me. I've, and, and when he asked him, he said, Elijah, you, you got to get out of this cave. Here's what I want you to do, Elijah. I want you to leave the cave and I want you to go anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And then I want you to go and anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, uh, to be the king over Israel. And then I want you to go and anoint Elijah to be a prophet and your protege. And so, and by the way, Elijah, you're not the only one. I have 7,000 in Israel that have never bowed their knee to Baal. You're not, <laughs> you're not the only one left. And I want to tell somebody in the Holy Ghost today who's living in a cave of disappointment, a cave of isolation. You feel like nobody cares about you. You feel like nobody understands. You are not the only one that's trying to live for God. Amen. It's not about you. At some point, it's time to stop feeling sorry for yourself. Now, God cares about us. He, he, he wants us to prosper. But at that point, it wasn't helping Elijah to stay in the cave. And God was telling him, if you want to change what's going on inside of you, you need to get out of this. i got a job for you to do. I've got people that you need to start anointing. I've got protégés that you need to start training. I've got other people that you need to minister to. But as long as you stay in your cave of isolation, all you're going to do is feel sorry for yourself. You're going to feel depressed and discouraged. Come on, somebody. It's time you came out of your cave. Waiting on somebody to encourage you. You need to get out of your cave and go encourage somebody. Waiting on somebody to tell you, you're doing a really good job. You need to get out of your cave and start doing what God called you to do. There is encouragement in the service. I want to remind you that it's the anointing that destroys the yoke. Amen. The anoint somebody say the anointing. It's the anointing that, that, that destroys the yoke. One of the first things that people do when they become discouraged and they, they move into their cave of isolation, one of the first things they do is say, I gotta give up my ministry. I gotta quit serving. But the truth is, it's that anointing. The anointing is only for the purpose of doing what God's called you to do. Amen. If you've got a yoke on your neck, don't whine about it. Don't complain about it. But roll up your sleeves and do what God has called you to do. It will. Your service will destroy the yoke. If you want to be encouraged, you will not be encouraged living in isolation. You've got to decide, I'm tired of staying here. I'm coming out of this cave. Now, let's quickly, let's get back to David's song for a cave. I'm, I'm coming to a close. We don't get the whole picture in 1 Samuel 22 about what all happened. I want us to look at the psalm and what David actually wrote. Psalms 57. Here's the lesson that David learned in the cave. You want to get out of the cave? Here's what you need to follow. David said, In the shadow of thy wings... 
I will make my refuge. Until the calamities be overpassed, I will cry unto God most high. In other words, I learned when I'm in my isolation that if I open up my mouth and I start singing about anything, I need to, I need to make sure that I'm crying out to the Lord. Amen. God is my refuge until the trouble is over. When I don't have anywhere else to run, I need to run to the Lord. Calamities will come, but calamities will also go. As long as I make my refuge in the Lord, everything is going to be okay. The problem oftentimes is not that God is, is uh, not available for a refuge. The problem sometimes is that we're not crying out to the Lord. We have, we have become, I believe, a generation that is so drunk on entertainment. And we wait for the church to pick us up. We wait for the church to encourage us. Come on. We got hot dogs and hamburgers. Uh, uh, come on. We got this ministry. We got VBS. We, we, we got all of these things. And, and there's nothing wrong with those things. We got all this stuff. And we have become far too dependent on that stuff. And we need to remember that you will never be encouraged because of stuff and entertainment. What was, what's going to pull you out of your cave is when you realize the thing that's missing in my life is the Lord. Oh. Hallelujah. Oh, I, 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 feel, I feel a Wednesday night Bible study spirit coming on right now. Amen. Too often, we can call for tacos, taco night, packed out. People, we're running out of tacos. I mean, that's everything. We have a choir concert. Oh, man, I'll be there. You can count on that. And we got a packed house. I'm here for the show, preacher. We call a prayer meeting. One or two. Hey Amen. We don't know how to cry out to the Lord. All we know how to do is have other people encourage us and pat us on the back. When is the last time you got alone with God and prayed until you had the victory? When's the last time you prayed until God met with you? Somebody better learn to get back on their knees again. Come on. It's time to reclaim your prayer life. It's time to build an altar in your house again. I'm going to make God my refuge. I've got to make him my refuge. I've got to make him the first person that I call. I'm going to stop calling everybody else saying, oh, life is bad. Everything's falling apart. I've got to call out to the Lord. Cry out to the God most high. And I'm going to, God's going to help me. So the first thing David learned was God is my refuge. Amen. Praise God. What we need is the Lord. That's why David later would write, from the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to a rock that is higher than I. From the end of the earth, no matter where I am on planet earth, amen, what I need more than anything else, when I'm in trouble, I'm gonna, all I need is to be able to get into the presence of the Lord. Amen, God is my refuge. Amen. I just need, to, I long for the presence of the Lord. As the dew pants after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. Come on, I know we desire a lot of things in life, but when is the last time that you desired the Lord? Because when you desire God, it's not about fulfilling your personal interest or your entertainment. It's not about patting yourself on the back. It's all about Him receiving all the glory. Come on, it's time to change our desire again. Let's get back to a place of desiring God. Amen. When David was in a cave, he also learned that the only one that deserves glory is God. David sang, be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens, and let thy glory be above all the earth. I haven't done anything that deserves glory. Listen, I believe that it's often self-promotion and entitlement and self-glorying that drives us to our caves in the first place. We, 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 we become discouraged because we think we're not getting what we deserve. 
I've earned a handshake. I've earned somebody reaching out to me. I've earned somebody propping me up when the truth is all we have ever earned is eternal damnation in a devil's hell. Amen. If it wasn't for the Lord, none of us would make it. Amen. What we've got to remember in our cave hours is that if it wasn't for the Lord, where would I be? Amen. I've got to have God. We need the Lord. So David learned that God deserves all the glory and he sang about it in the cave. Your song in the cave needs to be less about you and your trouble and it all needs to be about the glory of God. God, you're so great. Amen. Make sure your song in the cave includes a verse about what you really deserve <laughs> and what God deserves. It's all about his glory. But that's not all David sang about in the cave. David also sang, my heart is fixed. Oh God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. I believe that our song in those moments of isolation in the caves of life should also include a declaration unto the Lord. Amen. When we feel so alone and wonder why nobody is picking us up and why nobody is giving us what we're due, amen, we need to make sure that we start singing about our determination. God, my heart is fixed. I'm not giving up. My mind is made up. God, I refuse to quit. Lord, you can count on me. I know I'm, I'm in a bad place right now, but God, I want to tell you right now, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to serve you. I, my mind is made up. My heart is fixed. I, I, whatever it takes, I'm going to make it to heaven. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. I've got my foot on the rock and my mind's made up. Though I walk through a lonely valley, though I drink from a, the bitter cup, when the devil comes a knocking, showing me an easier way, I stand right square on my feet. I throw my head in the air. I look him straight in the eye. I say my foot is on the rock and my mind's made up. Amen. If you don't have the energy to sing that, just say, I have decided to follow Jesus. Hallelujah. I have decided to follow Jesus. Amen. If you're old school, you can even sing, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. Come on, somebody needs to declare to the enemy. You need to tell the Lord, I'm not quitting. I'm not giving up. I'm going to finish what I started. I refuse to quit. Hallelujah. Somebody ought to turn around to your neighbor right now and tell him my heart is fixed. I'm not giving up. I know the devil thinks I'm going to quit, but I'm not quitting. My mind is made up. I choose to serve the Lord. Are you happy? No, but I am determined. I'm going to get through this. God's going to bring me out of this. Amen. I, this is not going to destroy me. My mind's made up. Musicians, please come. And then he says, when I get out of this, <laughs> Lord, I will praise thee. Oh, Lord, among the people, I will sing unto thee among the nations. Psalms 57 and verse 9. Amen. Lord, I'm not quitting church. I refuse to stay in isolation. But, Lord, I'm going to come out of this, and I'm going back to church. And I'm going to praise you in the sanctuary. Lord, there's going to be a day you're going to take this trouble and you will turn it into a testimony. God, I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know how you're going to bring me out of this, but I'm going to shout about this. I'm going to run the aisles over this. Lord, I'm going to give you glory over this. Hallelujah. This will not destroy me. I know I'm living in isolation right now. And I feel like giving. Oh, I feel. Oh, but I'm not going to focus on my feeling. My mind is made up. And I'm going to praise God. God, you're going to get the glory out of this. It's going to happen. Can we stand together? <laughs> it's not an accident. That at this moment, when he's making his declaration, that is when... The prophet Gad shows up, and, and, and he, he has a word for David. David's been talking about, God, when I get out of this, I'm going to praise you. 
God, when I get out of this, I'm going to give you the glory. I'm going to praise you in the sanctuary. I'm going to give you all the glory. When I make it through this, when I get over this, when you bring me out of this, I'm going to praise you for it. He's talking about what he's going to do, and he's giving God all the praise. Amen. It's going to happen. And, and the prophet Gad shows up and says, all right, abide not in the hole. In other words, get out. All right, David, you got to get out of your holding place. You got to get out of your isolation. Come out of your cave. And I want you to get into the land of Judah. I think we all know the land of Judah is the land of praise. The word Judah means praise. So, David, here's what you got to do you got to quit talking now. You got to quit making claims now. At this point in your life, you got to quit talking about what you're going to do. And it's time to put some shoe leather behind your commitment. It's time to make a move. It's time to take a step, David, and you need to get back into the land of praise. I don't want you to live in a cave. I want you to live in a place where everybody's praisers. I want you to get among some other worshipers in the house. You see, in the land of Judah, there were a lot of other Judites. Amen. There were a lot of other people that were praisers. Amen part of the tribe. Amen. Part of our problem is when we go into cave, the only time we want to hang out with people are people that are living in the same discouragement. We are in the cave. You might just need to get around some worshipers. You might need to get another brother, another sister that always has the victory. Start rubbing shoulders with the worshiper. Come on. Come on, David. It's time to get out of your cave. Come on. It's time to take a step. I realize for somebody here this morning, it may be difficult to take that step. Perhaps you have never obeyed the gospel and you've come to church and you're looking for a change in your life. Change only comes beginning with the obedience of the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Amen. If you haven't obeyed that, that's the first thing you need to do is obey the gospel. Repent of your sins. We'll do that at this area that we call the altar. Our ministers are here. They're stepping across the front. They're going to be here to pray with you. Amen. They can pray with you as you repent and as you are baptized. If you've never been baptized in water, specifically in the name of Jesus, perhaps you've been baptized in the titles, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. You need to get rebaptized, just like they were in the in the uh, in Acts chapter 19 with the disciples of John. They were rebaptized because they weren't baptized in Jesus' name. And you need to get rebaptized. Our ministers can do that here today. So if you are ready to start this journey, that's a good place to start. God also wants to fill you with his spirit. That's the, that's the, the threefold gospel. The repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, the infilling of the Holy Ghost, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. So if you've done one or two of those, you need to take that next step. But sometimes when God meets up with us, we have been living in our cave so long gotten comfortable in our cave we enjoy it we're building the church around it our church experience around it we're putting up walls around it protecting our cave because we've convinced ourselves that this is the safe place to be we've got to make this safe but our response in that moment what God really wants us to do is probably the exact opposite of what you feel like doing and that is stepping out of the isolation. It's scary when you're stepping out of a cave. You've been living in it for a long time. It's scary because you don't know what it holds. Amen. You almost feel vulnerable to injury again because somebody hurts you and you feel like, here I go. Somebody's going to take advantage of me again. I know what it's like to live in those caves of depression and discouragement. God sent me here this morning with one assignment is to reach one or two people. Maybe this won't minister to everybody, but there's a few people in this church that you have been living in a cave far too long. And maybe people around you don't know it. Maybe they see the smile and they see your countenance and they don't realize that at home you're discouraged and you're depressed and you're staring at the wall for hours and you're wondering every morning what's the purpose of getting up out of bed. All of those feelings of living in a cave are tormenting you and God sent me here to tell you it's time to step out. Come on. Come on. It's time to step out of your cave right now. Amen. God is speaking to somebody. I wonder if we can lift our hands and pray. And if God is talking to you, come on, don't wait. Just step out. Step out. I wonder now, join in with us. Sometimes it's easier if, if people are coming with us. Why don't you invite somebody to come to the altar with you? When you come, just walk all the way forward. If you're wrestling, come on, step out of your cave. Step out of your cave. How he feels.
Hallelujah. That's it. Step all the way forward. Come on, step all the way forward. Hallelujah. Allow people to come in behind you. Oh, yes, Lord. How he picked me up. He picked me up. Turned me around. This Hallelujah. It's not about me. It's not about me. What I'm owed. Oh, the enemy wants you to stay there. You're not afraid of the cave. Oh, yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, God's got a great life for you. He's got victory for you. But you got to come out of the cave. Don't let the enemy's discouragement keep you in your cave.
Hallelujah, Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, God, for what you're doing in this place today. Thank you for your presence, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For somebody that's living in the cave, a place of isolation, you can operate outside of the cave and you can even have relationships with people. But inside, you're wrestling with torment. And like David, you're whispering under your breath, I wish somebody would do something for me. It's not long before bitterness is going to try to find a place in your spirit and your heart. You're going to become bitter at people for not helping you, bitter at church for not lifting you, recognizing family members. You just become a, a cesspool of toxicity and you just, you're just looking for people to pick you up. And the truth is the answer is not in what people can bring. The answer is for you to decide, I'm not staying in this cave any longer. There's a work to do. And the way that I fix me, and the way that I fix my mind, and the situation I'm wrestling with, is to get out of this isolated place. Step out. Do what God's called me to do. Start encouraging other people. Amen. And God can use you in a cave, David. God used David in a cave. He encouraged a lot of people. You know, it could be that God wants to use you to lead other people out of the cave too. Amen. But you, you're, you're never going to experience victory or the joy of life again until you make that decision. I can make a difference. I'm going to start giving God the glory. You know, it's what's crazy about dis places of depression and discouragement. It feels as though we're feeling bad about ourselves, but the truth is all of that is often rooted in pride because it's, it's focused on me and what people didn't provide for me and how people didn't give me what I deserve and what, and the truth is whenever we turn all of that over to the Lord and say, God, I don't deserve anything, but you deserve everything. Amen. Suddenly, we get pulled out of our cave. Amen. God, God is so good. I love what I feel in this place. Amen. Brother Sol Carrillo, one of our ministers, our administrative pastor, I'm asking him to come at this time, and he's going to pray a prayer of dismissal. Before he comes, though, I want to do two things. First, or actually three things. First thing is, I want to tell you, if you're looking for a home church, I encourage you to come back and, and, and do what we call stick six, okay? Just, that means... Be in at least six services, and by the end of six services, you'll be able to make an educated decision on whether or not we're the church for you. And so that's that's the first thing. The second thing is, if you're a guest here today, make sure that you take your token. Don't go home with that. Take it over to the cafe. You can go straight to the front of the line. As a matter of fact, if you will hold your token out in your hand when you walk through the foyer, somebody will see you and will help you to get over to the cafe if you don't feel comfortable going in by yourself but go straight to the front of the line even if there's a line you walk to the front you're a guest you're an important person first or second time guest make sure that you use that token it's not going to do you any good it won't spend at Chuck E. Cheese it's not going to buy you anything but here it'll actually get you something get you some free stuff so I encourage you to stop by that's the second thing the third thing is this and I'm, I'll be done and that is I want to encourage everyone to be back in service tonight it's been a long time since we've done this but you're going to get to hear a little tag team preaching tonight and so you're going to get to hear a lot of our younger ministers and people that you maybe have never heard before and I know it's going to be a blessing and we're going to give them all just a short period of time and they're going to deliver the word of the Lord and so it'll be some of the shortest sermons you've ever heard and uh, but there's just several of them so I'm uh, I'm looking forward to that tonight I encourage you to be back here at uh, seven uh, I'm sorry at six don't be back here at seven be back here at six o'clock and uh, we'll see you in brother Korea would you come and pray thank you pastor amen what a powerful message that was it makes me think I read a statistic a statistic once that said the average time a family stays in a home is about eight years and they sell and they move on 
And we know that caves aren't meant to be forever. Storms aren't meant to be forever. We can't be making caves and storms our homes forever. We got to move forward and God wants to give us the, the tools that we need. And I know that that message is a tool that we're going to use to help us continue to move forward. Let's pray this morning to be dismissed. Thank you, Lord God, for speaking to us, Lord. I know that your word is doing a work in all of us. Help us, Lord, today. Help us tomorrow, God, to continue to walk in your purpose and your will for our lives. I thank you for what's going to happen this week here for VBS, Lord. And I know that you're going to bless those efforts as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. Thank you, church. You may be dismissed this morning. Caleb Price, upon confession of your faith and according to the word of God, I now baptize you in Jesus' name for remission of sins.